Hello, everybody. Adam Bergman here, tax attorney and founder of IRA Financial. And on today's video, how to use leverage to buy real estate, hopefully without tax. So I wanted to do this uh, video because I get a lot of questions from real estate investors who are looking to use their retirement money to buy real estate. And of course, like every smart real estate investor, the key question is, how do you use leverage in a retirement account to maximize returns? <clears throat> so this is what today's video is going to address. Um, I've been discussing this topic for many, many years. I think I have some very unique solutions that uh, our clients have used, hopefully, to maximize their returns. So I'm very, very excited to share it with all of you guys. And hopefully you can learn about it and become a more tax-efficient uh, retirement investor. So before I jump into how the solutions work for using leverage, leverage means a loan. Okay, that's an, another word for a loan, leverage, <coughs> just a fancier word. Uh, before I get into how those solutions work, some ways for reducing tax when using leverage, let's talk about how the unrelated business income tax slash unrelated debt finance income rules work because that is the uh, basis for uh, the leverage um, solution. So in general, when you use a retirement account to make an investment, whether it's an IRA or a 401k, there is no tax, right? That's the beauty of using a retirement account to invest is you not only get a deduction if you're making a pre-tax contribution to an IRA or 401k, but your money grows without tax in that retirement account. That is one of the pillars of our retirement system and why it's such an attractive way to save. <clears throat> that is the encouragement the government is giving us so we save more. That is known as tax deferral or tax-free growth or compounding returns. And that really is the pillar of uh, the retirement system. So when your retirement account generates the following categories of income, they are generally not subject to tax. That is capital gains, interest, dividends, royalties, rental income. Those are the five passive activity categories that generally will exempt your returns from tax, meaning the funds go back to your retirement account tax-free, which is the name of the game. So whether you buy and sell stock, get a dividend from stock, interest from a bond, rental real estate, maybe royalties from a patent or copyright. Those will go back to your retirement account without tax. And those are the five passive income buckets. <clears throat> and that really satisfies uh, probably 95% of all retirement investments are focused on those five passive income categories. So, for most Americans, this UBIT, unrelated business income tax or unrelated debt finance income tax, which I'm going to talk in detail about today, is not really a relevant subject because they buy and sell stocks, buy and sell cryptos, buy and sell real estate without leverage. We'll get to that in a minute. Interest from a bond, interest from a loan, rental income <coughs> from real estate without leverage, royalty from a royalty type of investment dividends from a stock like Apple or Tesla, that would go back to the retirement account tax free. So what is this unrelated business income tax, this UDFI, these four letter words? And I call them four letter words because they're actually worse than the four letter words uh, you know, my kids use all around the house, which I'm not sure how they, they learned, but they know. Them. Um, <clears throat> why are they worse? Well, because there's a tax bite. It's not just a really bad, ugly word. There's actually a tax consequences. So before I get into what those tax consequences is or are, let's talk about where these rules came from and why they apply to retirement accounts. So the unrelated business income tax slash unrelated debt finance income rules, and they're all part of this same UBIT, UBTI family. So when I talk about unrelated business income tax or unrelated debt finance income tax, it's all part of the UBIT world. When I say UBIT, it means unrelated business income tax. Some people call it unrelated business taxable income, UBTI, whatever you want to call it, it's all part of the same family. And it's really not a family you want to be in. Why? 
because it imposes a tax, which can travel as high as 37% once you hit around 15K on the income allocated to the retirement account. Now, the good news is it only really covers three types of transactions, three small types of transactions. The bad news is it actually exists. And in my estimation, it should not apply to retirement accounts. Um, and I'll explain why. The UBIT rules, UDFI, they're put in the tax code a long time ago, back in the 50s, cover section five, really 511 to 514 of the tax code. They're very specific. And they were put in the code really to stop businesses like McDonald's, to set up charities and run their business, sell the, the burgers in a charity and never pay tax. <clears throat> That's what Congress was concerned about, that companies would just set up charities, run their business through their charity and never pay tax. So let's break down the words unrelated business income tax, right? The two words are the most important words, unrelated business. So Congress said, okay, if you're a charity, let's say you are a hospital or a church or you provide uh, education to the poor or you um, donate um, clothes to the poor, whatever that exempt purpose is, if that charity does something that's unrelated to its exempt purpose, like maybe it sells a bicycle or it sells iPhones or it sells coffee, but its exempt purpose is to, I don't know, save lives or, um, be a church and uh, speak the word of God, Congress said, hey, we're going to have to tax you like a business. Because again, what is this unrelated business income tax? Just let's sound those words out, unrelated business. So they're basically saying, listen, if you're a charity and you're generating contributions or revenue from your exempt purpose, hospitals saving lives, right? That's cool. You can do that. You don't have to pay tax on that revenue. But if you're a hospital and you're selling magazines or um, bicycles or cars or flowers, it's probably not <coughs> part of your exempt purpose. And we're going to tax you because if not, what would happen is everyone would just set up charities, run their business through charities, never pay tax, take a huge salary, and the government would never collect tax revenue. So they put these, these rules into f effect um, <coughs> and it's, you know, work relatively well when it, focuses on charities. It makes sense, right? If you're a church and you're selling iPhones or desks, like it's, it's not really part of your exempt purpose. Like, I guess you should be taxed like a business. Now they didn't just pick the corporate rates. They picked the trust rates since a charity is a trust, right? It's a 501 C three trust. So the trust rates, <coughs> excuse me. Um, they have the same tax maximum tax rate, 37%. The only problem is, you get to that maximum tax rate at a very, very low income threshold. Whereas if you are an individual, you will only get to the highest tax rate if you make more than a 693,750 married file jointly. <coughs> so with a trust, uh, it's 15K or so. So a must, much, much lower threshold. So now that we know what unrelated business income tax works, you may be saying, well, Adam, how could that apply to charities? How, I mean, how could that apply to retirement accounts? IRAs and 401ks were put in the tax code in 1974 by ERISA. Now, they are taxed like charities, meaning they're tax exempt. They're 501. They're not 501c3s. They're 501a trusts, which is good. That's why we love IRAs and 401ks, because you do not pay tax in general when you have income or gains in a retirement account, just like a charity. But we know an IRA or 401k does not have an unrelated business purpose, right? <clears throat> it's only purpose is to grow, whether by stocks, mutual funds, ETFs, bonds, real estate, gold, cryptos, and hedge funds, private equity funds. It's only goal is to grow and have more money for its owner. Unlike a charity that actually has an exempt purpose, right? A hospital save lives, not to sell iPhones. So you get into a bit of a quandary. It's like, hey, we have these rules, unrelated business income tax rules that seemingly applies to IRAs and 401ks because they're taxed as exempt trusts under 501. But these rules don't really make a lot of sense for them because they don't have an exempt purpose. Now, you and I can all agree on that. The problem is the folks in Washington don't really know what we're talking about. 
So I've had multiple conversations with, with multiple folks on both sides of the aisle that are part of the Ways and Means Committee, and they get it. They're like, Adam, yeah, it makes no sense. Talk to me about it. And I've had conversations and I've written to them. It just doesn't seem to go past their desk. Uh, kind of <laughs> email, conference call, and it's like, okay, let's look into it. I'm going to talk to my staff. And it just never goes anywhere. Uh, probably for multiple reasons, i.e. they do collect some tax revenues from it. So like why close the door on a you know fluid of money coming in? There's no incentive, even though it actually stops investment because we'll get to the three buckets of investments that could trigger the UBIT for IRAs. And then we'll get into the UDFI bucket. Um, so there's no real incentive to close it off. Although I, I do think there is, and, and I'll summarize and conclude why I think these UDFI, UBTI rules are actually hurting America. So <clears throat> let's talk about the three categories and I'll leave the UDFI, the leverage one to the end so we can focus on that. So the first is if you use a loan or margin to buy real to buy stocks or any asset. <coughs> Excuse me. When I say loan, loan is leverage. But when it comes to a retirement account, the leverage must be non-recourse. What does non-recourse mean? It means a loan you do not personally guarantee. Why is that the case? Well, Internal Revenue Code Section forty nine seventy five C two B says. You can't extend credit to your retirement account. And when you personally guarantee a loan, it's believed to you are extending credit to that retirement account. So the extension of credit occurs when you personally guarantee a loan. That's at least what the definition uh, suggests. So if you do a personal guarantee on a loan to your IRA, you are extending credit and thus violating 4975 and therefore creating a prohibited transaction, which is what we do not want to do, right? Because that can violate the rules. It blows up your IRA, creates tax and penalties. And that's something we absolutely 100% want to avoid. So the first category is you have to use a non-recourse loan, so a margin loan that acquires an asset like stock. So I got a good question for from a team member a couple weeks ago, and she asked, well, do all loans need to be secured? And the answer is no, technically not. But the way a non-recourse loan works is that the underlying asset is securing the loan. So if you're using a non-recourse loan to buy stock, it's, it's the stocks you're putting up as collateral is securing the loan. Now, if the stocks keep dropping, you're going to be forced to liquidate to save your position. If it's real estate, the home that you are buying will secure that loan. That's the asset that's securing the loan. The only difference is a non-recourse loan you as the IRA owner or any disqualified person is not securing or personally guaranteeing the loan. The loan is being secured by the underlying asset. So again, first category that triggers UBIT or UDFI is use a loan to buy an asset like stock. Second, your IRA or 401k invests in an active business. So an active trader business through a pass-through entity. <clears throat> and what's a pass-through entity? pass-through entities and LLC or S-Corp or partnership. Okay, not a C-Corp. So a C-Corp, think of it as a big box. C-Corporation has a corporate level tax, which is 21%. And that's why it's not a pass-through because it has an entity level tax. There's also a shareholder level tax, which is why a corporation know, is known to have two layers of tax. A LLC has one layer tax only at the shareholder or member level. There is no entity level tax. So that's why the UBIT rules come in because it has to impose a tax at the entity level. So again, it's only triggered if your IRA or 401k invests in an active trader business, not just any LLC, an active trader business through a pass through entity like an LLC. So what's an active trader business, right? A restaurant, a bar, a consulting company, a software company, right? You know it's active trader business. Well, what about real estate? Well, real estate could be active, right? You could build 50 homes like the Toll Brothers, <coughs> Lennar, or you could be passive, right? You file a Schedule E, you got a couple Airbnbs, maybe do some rental income. It's how you treat the business. So if you're investing in some passive real estate through an IRA LLC, that's not going to trigger UBIT in itself. But if you're investing in a real estate development company that has employees and you know doing all kinds of real estate development business, then you may have UBIT. Now, the way the UBIT rules work is 
you have a thousand dollar layer or security blanket. So if you generate less than a thousand dollars of net income allocated to the IRA, there's no UBIT tax. So if your IRA owns 50% of a proper a project and it generates $800 of income, only 400 is attributable to your IRA, <clears throat> you're under that thousand dollar threshold. So you don't have to pay any UBIT tax. How do you pay UBIT tax? You file a 990T. And when I say, you know, we actually do it for our clients. So another great advantage of IRA Financial, we're not just the best in setting up self record IRAs or solo Ks. We actually will file your 990T. We'll do advisory services, tax reporting, tax consulting. So we're really a full service firm, really the only one in the country. Um, again, not, not only are we amazing at setting this up, but we'll hold your hand. We'll provide you the administration, the consulting, the record keeping, and also the tax reporting, which I think is super important and which separates us from uh, everyone else in the space, which I'm really proud about. So again, under a thousand bucks, you're good. Over a thousand bucks, then <coughs> you have to deal with the trust tax rates. Once you get into over 15K or so, you're looking at a 37% tax that is your IRA pays. You don't pay it personally. Your IRA pays, the 990T is due April 15th, extension October 15th. We handle it for you, so do not worry if you're a client. Obviously, you need to work with us so we know uh, the details. Now, what happens if you have losses? Well, losses actually have value. Um, why? <clears throat> because if you have losses, whether it's investing in a business that has losses allocated to your IRA, or we'll get into real estate acquisition and debtness in a minute, you can file a 990T, lock in those losses. So when you have gains in the future, those losses will eat up those gains. So hopefully you'll reduce the uh, tax due on the unrelated business tax income. So again, let's just focus again, these two categories, non-recourse loan to buy an asset like stock, your IRA or 401k invests in an active trader business, like a restaurant or bar or consulting company or software company through a pass-through entity like an LLC. What about an S-Corp? S-Corps are pass-through. Can an IRA invest in an S-Corp? The answer is no. Why? That's an S-Corp rule. Under the S-Corp, Shareholder rules under 1363, um, an IRA cannot be a shareholder. A 401k technically can be a shareholder of an S Corp, not an IRA. The only problem is it's going to trigger UBIT, right? Just like an LLC. It won't blow the S Corp rules. An IRA, if an IRA invests in an S Corp, <coughs> what will happen is the S election will be invalidated. The S Corp will turn into a C Corp, and your other partners may not be very happy with that. It's not a primitive transaction issue. It's an S corp issue. Now, let's get into the meat of today's video. The heart of it is UDFI, unrelated debt finance income. This is in section 514 of the Internal Revenue Code. Okay. It kind of follows the same lines of the using a loan to buy stock. The loan has to be non-recourse, right? You cannot personally the loan to buy real estate, just like you can't personally guarantee the loan to buy stock, okay, that's just a rule under 49.75. But 514 states that if you use an IRA and it acquires real estate by using acquisition indebtedness, which is a loan, that process, that transaction triggers the unrelated debt finance income rules, which in, in effect triggers the unrelated business taxable income rules. Right. So if you trigger unrelated debt finance income tax, UDFI, you automatically trigger the UBTI. Just kind of runs in parallel. You knock, you hit UDFI, you're in the UBIT world. You don't want to be in the UBTI world. Why? Because you can pay tax as high as 37%. You don't want to do that because in general, when you use an IRA or 401k to invest, you're exempt from tax, right? That's one of the reasons there's $13 trillion in IRA money, 65 million IRAs. $33 trillion in retirement money. It's a smart way to invest, right? It just makes sense why you take advantage of compounding returns. Your money should double every eight years, assuming an 8% rate of return. I keep saying this, but it's true. Albert Einstein coined compounding returns, the eighth wonder of the world. Why? Because it makes a lot of sense. So UDFI, it's triggered when an IRA uses a non-recourse loan to buy real estate. So how do you calculate this work, how it works? So 
Simple example, you have $100,000 in your IRA, you borrow $100,000 from a non-disqualified person, could be a brother, sister, aunt, uncle, cousin, friend, neighbor, or a lender or a bank. Remember, you cannot personally guarantee the loan, just like margin. So generally, you're going to need to put down at least 30%. You're probably going to have to pay a little bit more in points because the lender is taking higher degree of risk. Why? Because if you fail to make loan payments in a timely fashion, they cannot go after you personally, right? Like a personal guarantee. If you have a mortgage, it's personally guaranteed. Since 2010, really, after the 08 financial crisis, every traditional loan mortgage has a personal guarantee. Not if you are a big hedge fund or real estate fund and you buy an apartment building or an office building, you're not going to probably personally guarantee it or maybe only a small amount you will. But if you're a little guy like us and you're buying a, a you know, single family residence, uh, whether for investment purposes or not, there will be a personal guarantee. Um, and that's really after 2010. So there are lenders and we know a lot of them that will work with our investors to provide a non-recourse loan, but you're going to have to put down at least 30 to 40%. And you'll pay a little bit more in points, but you can get that loan done. Now, unfortunately, as I mentioned, with an IRA, you have to deal with UBIT. Um, I'll get to some solutions in a minute, but let's just focus on the IRA. UBIT, UDFI regime, how does that work? So I have 100K in an IRA. The house is 200K. I go to a lender. I borrow 100K. I take the 200K. I buy the house. Now, let's say I generate... 10,000 bucks of net profits after depreciation, after expenses, after loan payments, I get 10,000 bucks left over. <clears throat> Since 50% of the 10,000 bucks is associated with the leverage, right? Because I borrowed 100K and I put in 100K, that's 200K, 100 divided by 200 is 50%. Essentially, 50% of the net income or profits or gains from the property will be subject to the UBIT tax. So not the full amount. It's all based off the leverage used. If I use 10%, 10% of the gains or income. If I use 90%, 90% of the income or gains. And then that tax rate, depending on how much it is, is imposed on that percentage. Now, again, the good news is you can take into account your percentage of expenses like depreciation and the like. So you could limit that number. In addition, if you have losses from previous years, which is synonymous with real estate investing, a lot of real estate projects do not have net income for many years. Why? There's accelerated depreciation, there's deduction, there's costs that go in to <coughs> buying and developing a project. So you can take advantage of that. You can use those losses by filing a 990T and then use those losses to offset future income. Okay. One other thing to keep in mind, as long as that loan is paid off prior to 12 months prior to a sale, you can actually do a non-recourse loan, right? Maybe you net out any of the income through the losses. And as so long as you pay off that loan and do not sell that property within a year, after a year, you could then basically forget that you ever use leverage and then sell that property and pay no you bet or any tax since it's in a retirement account. So you just got to remember there's a 12 month look back if you have leverage. But once you eliminate that loan after 12 months, it's like the loan never existed and you could take advantage of the power of the retirement account and um, not pay any tax. Now, if you noticed, I mentioned IRA. I did not mention 401ks. Why? Because 401k, solo 401ks, defined benefit plans, private sharing plans, they can take advantage of an exception in the Internal Revenue Code under Section 514C9 that allows a 401k to use a non-recourse loan to use leverage to buy real estate without triggering the UBIT tax. Now, a lot of people just aren't <coughs> it's, you know, really understand why, why is 401ks exempted but not IRAs. The legislative history is unclear. There's some language from 1982 that suggests they wanted to provide trustees of pension plans, uh, like the big, larger defined benefit um, plans, more investment opportunities, options. Uh, we know a lot of large uh, state pension plans, teachers plans, 
like CalPERS, for example, in California, it's the largest uh, pension plan. They do a lot of alternative asset investments like into real estate funds, hedge funds, venture capital funds, and private equity funds. So clearly they wanted to provide those funds with the opportunity to do so. And by doing that, they had to open it up to all of us. They did not want it to do to have that IRAs have that option, which again, I think is foolish. And I think ultimately hurts America. Why? Because as I mentioned, there's $33 trillion of retirement money. There's $13 trillion of IRA money. Now a lot more money would go into real estate development, interesting community real estate projects if UBIT didn't exist. And if those tax rules did not apply to IRAs, but because they do a lot of IRA money does not go into uh, real estate projects that include leverage um, because of the UBIT tax. And that's only hurting us because there's so many more projects that could get built that could provide low income housing or community development or other important real estate projects for our uh, local communities. Um, and it's just not getting done because of these UBIT rules. So basically in order to <coughs> take advantage of the exception under 514C9, you basically need um, to have a real loan, right? It can't be a fixed amount. It can't be really um, any um, any type of uh, loan that's, that's not traditional. Um, you know, you have to, can't do seller financing and UBIT, that, that, there's no exception for that. Um, and basically the um, 401k plan or the uh, qualified organization, it needs to get the right types of allocations. You can't have monkey business where uh, my 401k owns 50% and Joe owns 50% and like and the, more of the allocations come to my 401k than Joe. Um, you have to have straight allocations, <clears throat> but as long as you're not doing seller financing, it's a real loan, you're basically doing normal uh, loan allocations from the partnership, normal profit allocations, you could take advantage of the exception in the tax code to allow a 401k to use non-recourse leverage to acquire real estate without triggering the UBIT tax, which is enormous. Okay. So now <clears throat> let's focus on how do you get around UBIT for using leverage with real estate? <clears throat> so first is obviously 514C9. You want to try to get into a 401k. Right. So how do you get into a solo K? So let's say you have an IRA, you, you, you're watching this video and you're like, oh, my goodness, I don't want to pay UBIT tax. That's crazy. I'm using leverage. No way. But I have a side business. It's a sole proprietor, Adam. Is that good? Sure. If you have any side gig, you could be an Uber driver. You can uh, sell shoes on eBay. You could uh, do consulting, a math tutor. You could be a Santa Claus ski teacher. Uh, I don't know, basketball teacher, whatever. If you have a side gig, okay, you can do it as a sole proprietor, single member LLC, LLC, corp, S corp. You don't need an entity. You could be a sole proprietor. <clears throat> you could set up a solo K. We'll roll over the pre-tax IRA funds tax-free to the 401k. And the 401k could acquire the real estate with leverage and not pay any UBIT tax. All right, so that is the first solution to eliminate the UBIT tax is to get into a solo 401k. That's obviously the best solution. Why? Because you can potentially limit 37%, reduce it down to zero. So obviously you need a side gig. It doesn't have to be a full-time gig. It doesn't have to be a million dollar business. The side gig can make a hundred bucks, a thousand bucks, 10,000 bucks. You just need to have a business. It can't be a hobby. Okay. But it doesn't have to be an entity. It could be a sole proprietorship in your name. Now, one other thing to note is that if you have only Roth IRA funds, <coughs> unfortunately a Roth IRA not able to be rolled into a solo K at this point. It should change in coming years, but as of today, not yet. So that's just something to keep in mind. It must be a pre-tax IRA, a pre-tax rollover that you can roll into the new solo 401k and then have the solo 401k by real estate using the non-recourse loan and you do not have to pay the UBIT tax. Second solution, blocker. Okay, a blocker corp. Generally, you're not going to be able to use a foreign blocker like Cayman Island Corporations for real estate because there's something called FERPTA. And that's a tax regime that imposes a 10% withholding tax on foreign owned real estate in the US. So if you're a foreign owned entity or foreigner and you own real estate in the United States, there's a FERPTA tax of 10 to 20% of gross withholding, which um, doesn't make the 
foreign blocker work. What's a blocker? It's basically taking a corporation, <coughs> excuse me, and blocking. So having the IRA or 401k own the corp and the corp owning the real estate. <coughs> and by doing that, you block the UBIT, right? Because remember I told you corporations do not pay UBIT tax. They pay the corporate tax rate since corporations have entity level taxation. Well, in 2023, the corporate tax rate is only 21%. So it's not horrible. So what you're doing, you're not eliminating the UBIT tax, but you're reducing 37% down to 21%. Okay, not horrible, not perfect, but it really mirrors the cap long-term capital gains tax rate for, for some uh, high income earners. So you can reduce 37 to 21, which again, if you own maybe, let's say you're, you're using 50-50 debt to equity ratio, 50% of the gains will be subject to UBIT. And I can then, instead of having a 37% tax, I can impose a 21% tax on that 50% by using the blocker. So it's not perfect like using a solo K where I can eliminate the UBIT tax to zero, but I can reduce it to 21%. So there you just got to run your numbers and make sure it still works. For a lot of folks, it makes sense because they want to use their retirement account. They need their personal savings for other projects, for uh, just you know general savings, general living. But they have this money in a retirement account. And they really want to hit a home run in this real estate project, whether it's a flip, whether it's an Airbnb, whether it's commercial, residential, domestic, foreign. The money's doing okay in the markets, but they think they can, you know, hit a two banger, double their money or, or get 10, 12% rate of return. And they're okay paying that 21% um, because uh, they still want to use those funds. That's something that I, you know, our team could help you kind of walk through, but ultimately that's going to be your solution, your decision, because you're going to know the economics of that transaction, you know, better than us. Okay. So at least that is a solution. It doesn't eliminate the UBIT tax but it'll reduce it down to 21%. Um, third way is to structure the transaction as a loan versus an investment, right? If you lend money into the project, you can get a stated rate of return, maybe 10%, 15%, 20%, whatever it is on your money invested. And the interest back is not subject to UBIT because interest is a passive category of income, not subject to the UBIT tax regime. <coughs> the downside of, of the loan is you're limiting your upside, right? Maybe you only get 10%, 12%, 20%. Whereas if you did an equity investment, you're not limited on the upside. Maybe you can hit a 10 banger, right? Maybe you, you, you hit a magical investment and you five times your money. So the loan won't give you that upside, but it will give you a nice state of return and it will get you around uh, UBIT, which, which is also you know, super nice. The other thing to consider is, is maybe you try to pay that loan off as quick as possible, right? Maybe if you're doing a long-term hold, maybe a 10, 15 year hold on the project and you think you could pay the loan off in five or seven years, then you say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to make high payments. I'm going to zero out my income. So I'm not going to have a lot of UBIT because I'm going to net it out. Um, no prepayment penalties. I'm just going to dump extra money, <clears throat> pay off the loan, pay that loan off quick. So after five, seven, 10 years, there's no more loan. And then I don't have to worry about UBIT anymore because the loan has been uh, eviscerated um, or extinguished. So that's another solution. Now, obviously, if you're going to do a flip in one year and you need to do the leverage, that may not be a possibility, but you still have the corp blocker solution of 21%. You also have, can you get into a solo K and reduce the UBIT tax to zero? Now, <clears throat> I get it. Not everyone has self-employment income. But if you do, and again, it doesn't have to be a million dollars business or even a hundred thousand dollar business. It could be, hey, I make a thousand bucks a year doing consulting or five thousand bucks a year or twenty thousand bucks, whatever it is, you have that option. It does not have to be a corporation. Um, it could be a sole proprietor, single member LLC. Um, and um, it's up to you in terms of what that business is. You just need to have some business with the anticipation of profit. Um, and then you can jump into a solo K so long as you have a pre-tax IRA or a rollover 401k, or if you're over 59 and a half and are currently employed with a 401k, you have a triggering event. And then you could take those funds and roll them into a solo K tax-free 
and then bang, you're in a nice situation where you can use leverage without triggering um, the UBIT tax. But those are really the three um, solutions. Obviously, the, the best one is the solo K or 401k plan if you're a small company. The second best is the uh, C Corp locker, reducing the UBIT tax of 37% to 21. And then the third, which isn't always viable for investors, is doing a loan instead of an equity investment. Um, because a lot of equity investors like the potential upside of the net income profits and uh, sale returns on uh, the asset. Okay, so that is, in a nutshell, um, kind of all of the rules you need to know about using leverage to buy real estate. Um, whether you're buying the real estate directly, you're going to hold it in an IRA, 401k, or you're investing in a real estate fund, um, these rules will kind of apply in the same uh, context. Uh, REITs, real estate investment trusts, are actually treated as corps. So REITs do not trigger UBIT, which is a nice little thing to know. Um, but the nice thing, again, of working with IRA Financial is we'll, we'll work with you. There's always potential solutions where if we can't eliminate it, we'll reduce it. And honestly, I think this is what separates us, why we've been able to grow from you know, up to 20, you know, 5,000 clients in a very short amount of time, with over 3 billion in assets. Uh, and I think we really do the best job in the market because – we don't just set this up and we're out the door and you're like, sorry, you have a question? Oh, go find a lawyer, go find an accountant. No, we are. I mean, I'm a tax lawyer. I don't think anyone in the country knows this stuff better than me. And I'm, I'm not, you know, very conceited. I'm just, just the truth. And I've written eight books. I've studied this stuff for 14 years. Plus you add my, you know, eight or nine years of uh, big tax law training. I, I ultimately don't think uh, anyone in the country knows this stuff as well as me. Um, I've worked with uh, law partners that I used to work for are now clients of IRA Financial. You know, we have huge, huge uh, real estate investment clients, some you know very well-known people. And then we have just, you know, people like you and me that just want expert advice to help them minimize their taxes and uh, find the most tax efficient solution to use their retirement funds to buy real estate. And that's what we love doing. I think is this of this as a puzzle. I work with my team every week. We have skill ups where we talk about this stuff, work on solutions, go through client questions. I'm actually starting a, a new weekly kind of fun little YouTube channel where I tell a self-directed IRA story of the week. So I'm, what I'm going to do for like 10, 15 minutes is just take a kind of interesting story, investment, structure, strategy, just kind of talk about it, address how we worked with the client, how did we dissect the problem, what solutions we had, kind of what the client ended up doing. Obviously, I'm not going to you know, spill secrets. I'm not going to talk about names or uh, specific investments, but just chalk, talk, chalk, talk in general terms. Um, and so we all can learn from each other. Um, so um, that's um, sub something that's some, you know, very important uh, and excited to do. So subscribe to this channel because I may go live. Like I'm not going to have a set schedule. I may go live tomorrow. I may do it on a Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, like whenever I, I hear something interesting, I'm just going to go live with it and, and talk about it. So if you subscribe to our amazing IRA financial channel, you'll be notified. And if you're too busy, then that's cool. But you can always go back to it when you have some free time and kind of listen or watch it and hopefully learn something that may help you or, or friends, family or clients. Um, so we can all you know learn from each other. So in conclusion, yeah, UBTI, UDFI is an ugly four-letter word, but there are some solutions, right? The Solo 401k, the C-Corp locker, structuring as a loan. Uh, there, may other, there may be some other solutions, too, that we could uh, work through based off your uh, scenario. Uh, maybe there's other retirement money to be used. Um, and that's something that we look forward to discussing. Again, we get excited about these challenges. Um yeah, we have a lot of clients that just kind of do run-of-the-mill stuff, and we don't get to talk to all our clients, uh, which is understandable. Um, but um, if you do have a you know specific topic, specific question, and UBIT's probably the area that causes the most questions, primitive transaction rules, I think our website does a really fabulous job kind of dissecting how those rules work because ultimately they're not that confusing. But UBIT is confusing, right, whether you're doing like a master or limited partnership, oil and gas, or you're doing real estate, or you're doing an active trader business, private equity firm, fund, real estate fund, venture capital fund, 
there's different um, caveats, different um, criteria, different elements that need to be looked at. And that's what we love doing. Um, so I got a UBIT. Is UBIT a concern for either my Roth IRA or my Roth Soul K? The only money used on a house flip comes from one of those two entities. No. So it's a good question. Um, if you're not using leverage, you don't have any issues. Okay. Um, if you flip real estate, <laughs> you're not going to hit UBIT. You're not flipping, flipping 30, 40 homes a year. You're not going to be deemed a business. You're a passive investor flipping a home in a retirement account. The IRS is not going to deem that a business. I promise you. Um, I'm not worried about that. If you use leverage and use a Roth IRA, sir, um, then yeah, you may have some leverage issues with UBIT. If it's a Roth solo 401k, you're going to be exempted from UBIT based off 514c9. So these are the things that if you have questions, talk to us. Our team is amazing. We have an amazing team of tax professionals. Um, if they have questions, it may get elevated up to me or, or someone on the executive team. And sometimes, you know what? I'll work with my team. Um, I have a team of, of lawyers I work with that sometimes, you know, I'll bounce some ideas off them. I'm not perfect. There's things I don't know, but I, I promise you, I will dig each corner and find the answer for you. This is what I love to do. This is my passion. <laughs> this is what I get excited. I am kind of a tax geek. Um, the harder, the more challenging question, the more fun it is for me. So, you know, after 14 years doing this stuff, I still get trumped. I still get uh, questions that I'm like, wow, that's pretty interesting. Let me look at that. So that's okay. Um, that's fun. So keep the questions coming. Um, definitely, uh, you want to be watching uh, our YouTube channel. You want to be checking out our podcast. We drop three podcasts a week, you know, three to four videos a week. If you have topic ideas, you can you know, leave a comment, a question. <clears throat> you can email us at info at and Just say, hey, ask Adam or question, whatever. It will get to us. You can chat us. You can call us. We love hearing from you. Uh, our team of tax professionals, always uh, interested to um, speak to you guys. You're smart. If you're, if you're listening or watching these videos, you're smart. Trust me. Um, the fact that you understand what a self-directed IRA is, you're already smarter than most people, right? I always give this example. I was an eighth year tax associate at you know, one of the largest law firms in the world, and I didn't know what a self-directed IRA was. This was back in 2008, okay? So yeah, self-directed IRAs are a lot farther along the way today than there were 15 years ago, but I can tell you every day I talk to smart people. When I say smart, I mean superbly smart, <laughs> probably smarter than me, and super rich and successful, and, and they call me up and say, hey, I'm I watched your video or I got your name from someone. I heard you're the guy. I can't believe you can do this stuff. Holy cow. We have this small company. We're doing this deal or I want to put a carried interest. I want to put founder stock in a Roth IRA. I want to do a profits interest. I want to buy real estate. I want to do a flip. I want to invest in this real estate fund, investment fund, foreign real estate, foreign project. Could you do it? Oh my goodness. I have this retirement money lying around. It's not doing anything. Uh, my advisor keeps saying I can't do this stuff but you can, right? And, and yeah, you can. It's in the code. The, if the government didn't want you doing this stuff, it would not have allowed you to do it. It's been in the code since 1974. So no matter what your traditional advisor says, it's allowed. There's millions and millions of investors have been doing this since the mid seventies. Okay. This is important. It's an important tool for diversification. It's an important tool to hedge against inflation. And it's an important tool to take control of your retirement. Statistics show if you have an interest and a focus on what you're investing in, you will be a better investor. So obviously, if you care about real estate or alternative assets, this is where your passion is, then I encourage you to learn. I'm not telling anyone to invest or what to invest in. It's not my job. Uh, I'm just a tax lawyer. But my job is to educate people on what the rules are in the tax code, empowering people to know how this system works. And the retirement system, I keep saying it, it's rigged in our favor right? They, the government actually wants us to succeed, believe it or not. No matter what you think about you know, foreign policy or healthcare or um, the IRS or the SEC, the retirement system works. The, actual, the government wants us to succeed. Why? I'm going to do a uh, podcast on this. Probably it's going to drop in the next week or two weeks, but the U.S. got a C plus in terms of when it looked, the Mercer report looked at it, I think it looked at about 50 or so countries. Um, larger third 
first world democratic free countries. And we're kind of in the low bucket. Um, so the government wants us to retire and save on our own. Why? Because they don't want us to be dependent on Social Security. And if you listen to this podcast on the Adam Talks feed, you'll hear what this report said and why it's super important that we take our future into our own hands, save, and the government's giving us the power to save and invest in what we know and trust, which for me, I like real estate. I also, of course, have stocks. I believe in diversification. I like to know I have a house, multiple houses actually, and no matter what happens in the market or, or war or whatever goes on in this crazy world, someone's going to live in this house. I mean, maybe I'll get a little less next year for rent, but someone's always going to need to find a place to live. And I just feel good doing it. So, but I also have cryptos and gold and stocks and ETFs. And I just believe in diversification. I think it makes everyone a better, more successful investor. It's worked for my family. It's worked for me. I've seen it work for my clients. So that's kind of what I preach, but that's the beauty of America. Kind of get to do what you want. Uh, okay. I'm going to do one more question. I'm going to um, sign off because we're going quite long and I know uh, some of you have other stuff to do. I'm 60. I have a business that is an LLC that generates 75 gross a year. Nice. I also have an IRA with IRA Financial Smart. Is there a way to limit the taxes on the business? Yeah, set up a solo K, Daniel, with the business. Um, I'm not sure how it's set up, if it's an LLC or S Corp or C Corp, but we can set you up a plan that you can generate up to um, 73,500 deductions. Now, on your 75K in gross income, if you have, I don't know, if you have $50,000 of net income, of profits, I could set up a solo K that will let you put away uh, up to 30K of that 50K tax deduction, plus either 25 or 20% of the 50K as another tax deduction. So if you have $50,000 of profits, net income, you're over 50, I could probably shelter almost 90% of that, 80 to 90% of it, <coughs> and the rest put in a Roth if you use a solo. So a lot of different ideas. Just reach out. We'll love to help you out. Um, and, you know, help you, um, you know, reduce taxable income and also put more money in a retirement account. Uh, most social security, how can you help that? Uh, Ron, if you're on social security and don't have a lot of net income, a uh, solo K won't work. Um, but if you have other uh, IRAs or Roth IRAs, there, there may be ways to grow that so you can generate more tax free um, streams of income. So there's always ways to, um, it's very unique. It's very fact and circumstances. That's why it's important to reach out. It's important to be part of our annual consultant service. And it's important to choose and work with IRA Financial. There's a reason why we're the best. We Again, we, we don't just set it up and just take uh, exit stage left. Like we're going to stay with you and, oh, you're a realtor. So you, um, you don't have, oh, maybe, if you're a realtor, then you have self-employment income, Ron, and we can set up a solo case. So be in touch. Um, Michael, the recording's available. Don't worry. As soon as I log off, this recording should be available so you can watch it whenever you want. Uh, hopefully, uh, it's uh, interesting, enticing, and stimulating. If it puts you to sleep, <laughs> I'm sorry, but at least you, uh, you know, it's healthier than drinking some whiskey or uh, doing something else. So um, that's it. I hope you guys enjoy the video. I'm going to do an, another one in a few weeks. Um, so keep... Um, on the lookout for a topic. If you have a topic you want me to do, just hit me up. If not, I'll, I'll keep it fun, I promise. And interesting, um, thanks to everyone who's watching, uh, participating, really love the feedback and the support, super important. Uh, we can do this together. We can literally all be tax-free millionaires. It's it's in front of us, the, the system's rigged in our favor. Three things we gotta do, that's it. I'm gonna end on this. Start as early as you can, be consistent, even if you just put in hundred bucks a year, if you have some tough years, just keep doing it. Keep the good habit going. And three, most importantly, trust the process. The more patient you are, the richer you will be. This is not a get rich quick scheme. This is about long, consistent approach to becoming a tax-free millionaire. We can all do this and you can make a lasting impact, not only for you, but your kids, your family, and leave an amazing tax-free legacy for your family. So thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Have a blessed day and I'll talk to everyone again soon. Take care.